Testing's all about risk and then how we reduce that risk. The iPhone, every time they bring out a new iPhone, they always talk about performance, don't they? So obviously people are testing all these things and then it's putting the marketing spin on it to obviously yeah. sell the benefits. But it's your Black Friday thing as well, isn't it? Big sale on Black Friday and then everybody goes on, the website crashes and yeah. absolute disaster. How can you say, right, it's Grand National Day, we're gonna get 30 million punters coming onto our websites when it's not Grand National Day and you haven't got 30 million? How can you? Can you test simulate, for that? Like simulate it. How do you come up with the numbers in the first place? You know, if you're coming into it, you're relying on what history tells you. But if you're going into a new space, there's, there's a new Grand National, for example, that mm. we don't know about, and we'll, we'll be able to start. Mm. This is the capacity that we think we're going to hit. You can go up to these levels before it's starting to be a problem, or you're going to have to start. Does that something. happen much? Hi, I'm Steve. I'm the digital director here at Spectrum Group. Today, I'm joined by the usual Neil Wells and John Vanoom. I'm also joined by a very special guest, Neil Findlay, who is managing consultant at test consultancy company, Sujeti. I hope you enjoy the conversation. And with all that said, welcome to Tomorrow's Workplace Today. Welcome to Neil Findlay. Uh, so we're going to do a deep dive into software testing. So are you, ready? are you ready for this? <laughs> I was going to say, now, shall I? you've got two dummies here. <laughs> you've gone from health and well-being last week to software testing. So are you ready for this, Neil? Right, so to switch on. Neil, do you want to introduce, introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, a bit about your background, if that's Yeah, right. sure. Uh, so I'm Neil Findlay. Uh, I'm a tester. I've been a tester for about 26 years uh, or so mm -hmm. now. Uh, role I probably do is more like a test management now uh, and manage testing, manage other testers and manage... The open support organisation in their testing uh, as, as well. So I work for a consultancy called Sujeti, which is part of Cap Gemini. All right. Uh, so yeah. So you go in and advise organisations on test strategy. Do you actually do the testing as well? Outsource yeah. that? Yeah. 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 So it can be all of that, and it can be it can be some of that as well. So typically, come in uh, either our organisation has no testing, so we'll come in and, and help sort that out and set that up and start giving them ideas of what good looks like and help them measure that and, and, and add value that way. Or we'll come in and to an existing project and say, right, uh, we're, we're here to help. How do we take this on? Uh, as consultancies, we tend to get involved in those projects that nobody else wants or the okay. difficult ones. I'd love to say we get easy ones. You know, we just need to rebrand the website, do that. But it tends to be those projects that may have failed, may have tight deadlines, may just have really difficult complexity and technical challenges. So not many of them in the world of IT that I'm not aware of. <laughs> well, there's no more, not, not many of the former rather than the latter. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Not, I can't remember the last time I did an easy project. <laughs> so yeah, we tend to come in where there's a business challenge or a business problem and okay. testing's there to help and support that. Okay, cool. So I'd like to break the subject of software testing down a little bit because it's there's lots to it mm -hmm. from my limited knowledge of software testing. So can you talk us through some of the, the different types of software testing that, yeah. that you have? So I think for the first uh, rumour to dispel is the fact that testing always, ha always happens at the end. You know, all the exciting stuff happens at the beginning, the development happens, then you give it to testers at the end. That's, that's not the case. Testing happens all the way through. Uh, every, everyone can be a tester. It's not just you have testers that are these people that can do this. You've answered one of my questions already. Mm. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> For sure. Conversation. Everyone can be a tester, but not everyone can be a good tester. Yeah. Humans are really good at testing and the fact that everyone te everyone tests every day. You know, when you pour a bath, you put your hand in, make sure is it hot or is it cold. He's so good at breaking things, this one. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's, that's the second other thing. That testers don't break things. They're already broken. Testers uh, find them. So yes, yeah, it's, it's already broken. Ah, okay. When we so get there, we find it. And, and, and that dispelled that myth. And, and previously, there used to be bad vibes between devs and testers and projects and whatever, because testers were always the ones saying, look, basically, your baby's ugly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Great analogy, analogy, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, the least to be told the baby's ugly. So we, we learned that lesson quite quickly. But breaking that analogy, we, we didn't break it. We just found out where it was broken, that side of things. So that's where we come in uh, and do that side of things. So the different phases. So... ISTQB is, is a kind of governing body that talks about testing as a, a standards level and it, it breaks testing into validation and verification. Okay. Yeah. So first part of it is about actually before you get something to test, you can you can test things like requirements. You know, you can ask questions, you can say, I see this requirement or I see this statement, what about this? What about this? What about that? So the ability to ask questions is our thing. I mean, you, you probably know everyone in your day-to-day -day life that the, the why people, you know, the why, 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 you know, if you've got children, they're 
children are born natural it. testers aren't yeah, they yeah, yeah. ask those why 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 questions so as testers we come in and ask those questions and, and the what ifs you know we've what ifs and what if we do this and what with this and what kind of numbers do you think about this yeah so you're you're getting testers involved at the kind of requirements capturing stage before we've written any code or anything like that just yeah, reading the yeah. documentation and because user what, stories yeah because what we do is we look at our requirements say right how do i write a test from this how do mm -hmm. i break this down and say this is what i would test okay. you know we talk about the, the happy path you know that in order to add two numbers and get the, get the right answer i'm going to write run this test mm. but then what about the unhappy paths what about uh, put three numbers in or if i put letters in or if i just run like that with a keyboard and all these sorts of things mm. so thinking about those things now at requirements level means that no code's even been written if we accept that's a valid condition if that's a valid requirement that we can put that in we can bake that in we can write code to accommodate that so it's almost like defect pre prevention rather than detection as you yeah. get further down the line you know you're stopping things coming in so looking at requirements looking at if you've got an existing system and how that looks as well so we're, we've talked a lot about functional things there and mm. uh, the way of adding numbers up you can also look at the what we call non-functional the other aspects of it even to the point of the branding as well does that follow the natural flow and brand of this system does it look the same as that system uh, in this digital world this this internet world your, your brand and your visibility is far more visible than it would be in the past where your systems are all behind the curtain as it were. You know, it mm. didn't matter that your logo was the wrong colour or shade or there was a spelling mistake on the front the front uh, login page and that's it. I think, well, that's really important now. Okay. So you've got functional testing, non-functional testing. What about, I guess, security and... Is it pen, penetration? Pen testing, and, things like that. Is that I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. So pen testing is, is probably quite... An, quite a you've never heard because it usually if anything goes wrong everyone yep. hears about it yeah uh, you lose confidence in your business if you've got a bank and you get uh, see something about something about security you're like oh, quickly looking at your balance and that side of things security is quite a big subject penetration testing is is an aspect of that that looks as someone who's trying to uh, access your system it's not just about hacking into the software, but it's also hacking into that organization as a penetration tester. Mm. So a penetration tester would probably turn up to your offices and try and get in the door without flashing the pass, yeah? Or they would phone up your IT desk saying, oh, I forgot my password, can you can you tell me what it is, please? This is this is my, my, my email address. Yep. So they try and emulate okay. scenarios, cool. not just by trying to do clever things by technical means or the black magic that sometimes surrounds penetration testing. Uh, security is a bigger umbrella like that. We can test for security. Uh, testers can test for security. If you think about it, uh, a login page where you have to go right into your username and your password, uh, and it said, oh, your username failed, uh, it's four characters, four numbers, then that then tells the the person trying to hack in that oh right okay well i know the first letters the first four are letters and the next four are numbers i'm going to brute force this i'm going to create a little program that's just going to run through all the permutations mm. might take days take weeks might take months but i now know the rules mm -hmm. uh, how to do that yeah i do so taking back to functional testing then so we've we've looked at the requirements we've mm. asked those questions and challenged those requirements then does the tester then stay involved from that point or do they then come back at the end once those requirements have been built and test that they've met those requirements? So a number of things can happen. It depends on how the project's running. Uh, Agile is quite popular now, so the testers tend to stay with, with that project or that team mm -hmm. uh, because we might get early delivery. It might not just be we wait till everything's ready to test. We may get, right, can you have a little look at this? We've done all the happy path criteria, so can you test that and make sure that that's okay? If there is a later delivery and the testers are finished writing their tests, there's all things we need to do. Uh, we need to prepare the environment to make sure that it's ready for accepting this new application or release. We need to make, think about data. Uh, we need to have data in advance because when we test, we need to have data in certain states as we go through our testing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just all about creating it when you get it on day one. We might need different roles and profiles because systems aren't about one person having all the access uh, when you log in, you've got administrators, you've got supervisors, you've got managers, you've got uh, view only, you've got all these different things. So you've got to profile and model uh, what the what the business world is going to use and, and reflect that back into your testing. And, and typically, sorry, John, is it typically the tester's responsibility to go and collate that data, find that data, set up user profiles, et cetera, et cetera, or would somebody else look after that? 
Uh, testers can do that. <coughs> testers responsible to say to identify that to say in my testing this is what I need. Mm, okay. More and more testers are becoming more technical. So mm. in the past, like, oh, I'm not technical. I need to be a tester. I don't know how to code. You know, it used to be a, if you knew how to code, you'd be a developer. If you didn't know how to code, mm. you'd be a tester. It's long since uh, outdated that argument. That now, testers, some of the best testers that I know and work with are people that that might not be the best coders, but they can read code, they can understand code. Mm. Yeah, so they can get that that side of it. So being a complete, you know, novice in the in the testing environment, um, from so I'm a tester, I've got my criteria that I'm testing against. Once I've stipulated that XYZ passes the test but one, two, three doesn't mm -hmm. What what are they literally just saying? Right, these work, these didn't. Are they giving detailed feedback as to why it didn't work? Or forgive the stupid question, but no, no, might as well start there. Fool's guide. <laughs> that's a perfect, perfectly valid thing. So, so you run a test, and some of it works, some of it doesn't work. Uh, good testers, what they'll do is they've always got this kind of chip in their chip in their shoulder, this little voice going, right, is it me? Have I done something wrong? Is it have I followed the instructions wrong? Is there something stupid that I've done? Because yeah, you were all human, aren't we? We yeah. make mistakes. So we'll check that and rerun it again to make sure. We then start, if, if it still happens, then we then start the, the defect management process. We need to we need to raise a bug. We need to find a bug. So I'll, I'll sidetrack on bugs. An interesting analogy that I found out, one of the most interesting things I've heard about tests, do you know why they're called bugs? <laughs> no idea. You so, have told me in the past, but I can't remember. So it's, it's a great story. So in the olden days, when you used to have computers as big as this room, and used to be valves, the electricity going through it across... What used to happen is insects used to get in and you'd shorten the electric electrical current. Really? So it'd be a bug, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the fault was a bug. So, so, okay. so it was a bug. Uh, apparently that's the show. It could be an urban legend, but I like yeah. that. Story. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd raise, you use a defect or a bug. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're called defects. You hear them called the issues. They might be called mm. observations. Defects does... There's a, there's a train of thought thinking, well, defects is quite a negative word. We don't like that. We're all about celebrating the positive and all that sort of thing. So mm. we might call them uh, incidents or observations and that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a bug. Well, interesting fact number two, do you know why it's called debugging? No, go on. <laughs> so when you got rid of the bugs, yeah, somebody's job had a big brush to push out of that and you used to push the brush, bug, brush to get rid of all the bugs. <laughs> Wow. wow. Again, it could be an urban We're legend, but I like it. <laughs> it's, it's, it leaves a mental image, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's how I remember it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's yeah. why I quite like calling them bugs, because it has that old that, 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 that relation back to it. So, yeah, back to, <laughs> back to the question. So, yeah, we raise defects, we raise bugs, and then that goes into the system, back to the developers. They look at that and say, right, when we raise a bug, we think that the bug's always in the software, but that's not the case. You know, the bug could be in the person. The person running it might might have run the test correctly, but because of training, they didn't know how to use the system. Yeah, so they might, oh, we need better training. We need to inform people how to use the system. Or the, the bug might be in the test. Somebody might have made a mistake in the test. Could be in the requirements, could be in the environment, could be in the data. And yes, it does happen. That it does sometimes happen in the application as well. Sorry, I was just going to interrupt there. So let's say, because in my world, it's like, where does it end? Because if if you test it, you test it. We all test it, and potentially we could all get different results. Mm -hmm. Where does where does it end? <laughs> so testing never ends; it stops. Okay. Yeah. There's another great, another, great, another novice <laughs> question. Another great comment. Because it's it's a valid question. If you were to test something as boring as it could be, I want you to test that cup. Yeah. Test that cup, so you'll put water in it, take water out of it, put hot things in it, uh, put it in the dishwasher, stack up all these things. You go, right, I'm, right, I can't think of anything else to test. Then I might give it to Neil and say, right, how do you test? Oh, right, well, I don't drink out of a cup because I don't drink tea or coffee. I'm going to put my pens in it. How many pens can I get in my cup? That side of things. Then you go, right, oh, I don't know, I'm finished testing now. Give it to Steve and he goes, oh, I'm an astronaut. I'm going to take my cup into space and see, can it float in space or is it going to crack and under the stresses and all these things? So... There's more and more tests you can do. Testing's all about risk and then how we reduce that risk. So as we f go further round that loop, we'll probably go, well, do you know what? This cup doesn't really need to go into space. You know, the, the, the risk of it going into space is quite little, little and we've got bigger problems if we're taking that cup into space than that. 
So we look at where the risk comes into. So the, the prioritization of the of the test to say, yeah, you just need to, that's where we draw the line. And sometimes you need independence because there are people and there are testers that, that, that will hold mm-hmm. on to something and you'll just keep on testing it. And, and you need some people like that that just keep, that, that, that they're the ones that will find all those points. Sorry, I'm, I'm, oh, on, I'm on a roll on. now. Um, so uh, first set of bugs, observations, mm-hmm. whatever we call it, um, have been identified, goes back to the dev team. <coughs> they, make, they make their you know um, refinements, if you like. Does it then go back to the same tester? Good question. Or do we then get another fresh set of eyes that goes, actually, I'm looking at it. You've kind of answered it earlier by saying, normally you have someone that goes into a team, mm-hmm. but if he, they are you know, testing it and then let's say it's a different day of the week and they've had a strenuous night the night before, whatever they're doing, squash or whatever, Steve. <laughs> and then they're, they're not as on the ball. How, how does it, how's it managed? So if, if the bug report is written well enough that anybody could to rerun that because the good practice is you write it in a way it's reproducible. Yeah, but otherwise you you get the mentality of oh this this works okay in my machine. Yeah, mm-hmm. if you have those steps defined well enough to say you do this, you do that with this data and this circumstances, then yet yeah, another tester could reproduce it. Good practice also with defects in the same way. If you think about it, if you raise a live service request. You know, if something's not working, your email's not working, you'll phone up and raise that with someone. It sh- tends to be the person who raised it is the one that closes it down at the end, or somebody will close it down on their behalf. And that just gives confidence that, yeah, this issue has been resolved sat- satisfactorily. So, yeah, but it does happen. Some systems, when we're in test, we do get a lot of bugs. It, it can be unmanageable, it can feel like a wave of them coming through, and, and, and you do need to farm that out across the team in order to. to rather than waiting for somebody's back sure. in holiday to come yeah, yeah. To, to resolve that for you. You said something earlier, which I want to just ask around, that um, the bug might, might not be a problem with the software. It might be the fact that the person's not been trained properly on the system. Mm-hmm. But do, do testers, should they, do they um, identify usability issues? Because in a way, that's a usability problem if they're not, they don't know how to use the system. And Yeah. You know. So I, the, 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 in testing, there's, there's people that do automation, there's performance, there's security testers. I'm of the belief that all testers have the ability to do that on different varying scales. Yeah, okay. you have performance testing who are, are really good at performance testing. I, I'm not taking that away. I'm, I celebrate those people because they do amazing things, and they are the ones that find the really important bugs. And what do you mean when you say performance testing? So performance test. So if you think back to analogy of adding two numbers together, a functional test would be if you added two numbers together, do you get the right answer? Do do, do they total correctly? A performance test would look at it and say, well, do you get the answer in the right period of time? Yeah, does that happen quickly? Does that happen within two seconds? That sort of thing. So performance measures that performance. Performance actually, what and why? You, another reason why you need experts in that area does cover things like volume and load and stress. So the analogy I use here for performances and, and I bought of someone else's, if, if you had a mini and you were to put you want to find out how many elephants you could put in the mini. You would do load testing, so you put two at a time. You would drive it, right? Can the mini run, right? Put another two in, two in, two in, and keep on going. Stress testing would be say, well, at what point does the mini start falling apart? How many elephants uh, do do you have in there as well? So there's a whole area within performance tests. It's not just one; it's one umbrella, but it's there's far more complexity. In my head, it pops into like you know the iPhone. Every time they bring out a new iPhone, they always talk about performance, don't they? Like, oh yeah, it's improved this speed by two times, yeah. or the mm-hmm. the battery lasts longer. So obviously, people are testing all these things, and then it's just putting the marketing spin on it to to obviously yeah. sell the benefits. But it's your Black Friday thing as well, isn't it? People going big sale on Black Friday and then everybody goes on and the website crashes and yeah. absolute disaster. Yeah, and yeah. Gr- Grand National is a good one yeah. to use as well. That's where we've seen uh, some of our, we've worked with some uh, betting clients as well and Grand mm-hmm. National just breaks all the records and, and, and that side of things. But back okay. to your point about bugs, the functional bugs are easier to find Performance bugs such as those ones there where you've got a, a peak event are harder to find, but actually they're more damaging to, to the business. Yeah. Because if you're a, a betting company and your system goes down in Grand National, it's like your busiest day of the year, mm. your reputation's out the window. You, you you know those sorts. So finding those well advanced of when you go live is, is, is really useful. And 
on on that now then how can you how can you slash can you get re um you know sort of uh Dress rehearsal, the situation, with horrendous, situation, yeah, yeah, horrendous sort of analogy. But how can you say, right, it's Grand National Day, we're going to get 30 million punters coming onto our websites when it's not Grand National Day and you haven't got 30 million? How can you, can you test simulate, for that? Like simulate it. Yeah. yeah, how do you model that? Yeah. yeah. So because you're talking such big numbers and such events, Black Friday as well, you need to use tools and technology to support that. Uh, in, in the old fashioned days you might have had 10 people all yeah. looking on it at the same time like right? well, everybody me. press ok and, and, and <laughs> yeah. I've been there and it's as draconian as it sounded it, it kind of worked yeah. but at that point no you're not because we understand so much more about how applications perform now due to tools and technologies monitoring tools tell us now that well actually we can see spikes before they happen and that side of things so how do we model that and test them? We we can do one of two things. We can do well do one of three things. We can we can we can model that and the fact say, right, we need a representative environment with representative load to be able to say, right, our environment's the same as live, so let's let's test that accordingly. We can scale down, so we can say, well, our environment, we can't afford another production environment because these aren't cheap. Yeah. So we'll scale it down to 50%. So put 50% of the load down and 50% of the requirement. Yeah. So we can do it, do those three things. Or equally, what we can do is we can report back saying, based on what we have got and the tools we have got, this is the capacity that we think we're going to hit before you hit a problem. Now, organizations that use the cloud and can scale that, can use that information to say, right, when we get to 80% of that top, top whack, we're going to spin off in our environment or we're going to create other uh, yeah. f technology assistance to, to avoid that that sort of situation. So again, it's back to testing and informing people based on, right, this is where we think you're going to hit problems based on these numbers. Because how, how do you come up with the numbers in the first place? You know, if you're coming into it, you're relying on what history tells you. But if you're going into a new space, there's, there's a new Grand National, for example, that mm. we don't know about and well, well, where do you start? So sometimes you've got to rely on testing to say, you can go up to these levels before it's starting to be a problem or you're going to have to start. Does that stuff. happen much? The, the We're going into a new environment we don't know, so can we test these particular analogies, if you like? Yeah, yeah. I think through the pace of change that we see in IT, you know, it's, it's phenomenal the rate of pace of change that we see that what we think is known now and look back in next year and go, we didn't know about I mean, COVID is another classic example. You know, it's we'll accelerated talk. everything, isn't it? Yeah, yeah all there's, the for all the, the public health systems and that side of things, the numbers that went through the roof there, that mm. you think, well, who, who, who could, or, well, people did foresee it, but who's going to listen to these people that foresee it? It's, mm. it's the, the, the yeah, challenges exactly. that we face. We don't know what we don't know. And it's, it's, yeah. it's that I bet that retail, that piece, because we use the, the betting app as a, analogy but previously that was a bookmaker you'd go into the, the betting yeah. shop and things out oh, you slip and it was all paper and then then obviously fast forward to now it's all on your app and no wonder my phone battery doesn't last i've got that many apps and every night he's doing updates and you look at it and it's like bug fixes and it's yeah. feature not a, to most of those updates are actually new feature sets a lot of them are bug fixes aren't they and and that's what if you're clicking into it it tells you which ones it is but um, and maybe once, I don't know, once a year, they might bring out a newer version to something or yeah. do a big drastic change. But I guess with, with software, it's that continuous cycle, isn't it? They're always trying to improve and tweak and make it make it better. Yeah, there's, there's two really interesting points that you raised there. The first, that your, your setup on your 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 device, primary test, we want to be as representative as possible. But there's so many variants now that mm. it, it's impossible to cover them all. Yeah. You know, back to the days before then to for mobile technology where you had a maybe a client server application, you could say, right, I'm going to test it on a three eight six, a four eight six, and a Pentium because that's what's in the office. You know, that's what we're going to be using. Now, mobile devices where we can test for different mobile variants. Uh, if you're going to run your Android and and the, the hundreds of variants of operating systems, yeah. and then then you got to think, well, what else is running on 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 that device as well? Mm -hmm. Or is that going to conflict with this and that that side of things? So. It's mind and, how old it is, and that's what makes right, it so yeah. interesting. People used to think testing was boring, used to think, oh, that's where people go, where well, well, the rubbish developers, you know, you don't know how to code, but it's, it's just so interesting and, 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 and all those variations. But, but the industry's grown massively then. Yeah. Because again, technology shifted it that way and 
again for like you say the importance of the app that user experience it needs to work otherwise there's so many other apps mm-hmm. that you can just jump straight on if that one don't work i'll jump onto another yeah, one yeah. so you've, you've lost that real estate for the exactly it's so important so it and that's needs. why before we talk about functional non-functional stuff there's a lot of of things like uh, even even uh, I remember a session about uh, we now need to taste how cool something is you know which is well how do you cool is a very <laughs> abstract <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. what's cool to me might not be cool to you but apparently it's a thing to look at because the, the, there's a generation that, that are motivated by that and if it's not there aesthetically pleasing they'll, they'll, they'll click away because they've not bought it it's free it's part of a service and that generation also may that may influence their where they where they buy where they bank where they shop just mm. because they don't like that because it, because it isn't cool and it, it's hard to get a bit hard to think about it in that way but you think well Apple's so much driven by that with with mm. their user interface and, and that's that customer things? experience making it seamless and easy to yeah. sort of uh, and they obviously they've created the whole ecosystem you can go from one device to another and you've got all your information there and I was just thinking like you mentioned banking there and that's a that. I changed banks purely and utterly because the the way that I interacted with, the way I was able to log on mm. and, and how simple it was, I just thought, yeah, it makes my life a lot easier. So that interaction piece, instead of, oh, I've got to put my card in and remember a pin and I've got to log in over it. There was so many steps. I was like, well, actually, with Monza, it was like, click that link, do that, and then it was in. I was like, oh, that was yeah. easy. And and their whole, their whole bank, I guess, was developed more from the platform mm-hmm. But it was platform first and customer experience and user interface first, and then it was like, skilled from there, I guess. I'm sure yeah. there's a commission for Monza. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love Monza. Just, 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 yeah. Yeah. And, and All the banks yeah. are available. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but well, that generation thing is, is, is such a huge challenge, not just for testing, but for IT, because those motivations there for you probably motivate you, but might demotivate others. Yeah, yeah. Some of the, the, the older generations, for example, move bank based on if I think about uh, my father-in-law or, or, or that generation, they're ma- they they joined banks based on the people they knew. They, they knew yeah. the bank manager. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. He used to live down the same street or their children oh, went to the same local school. branches, yeah. like I can walk to it. Thing. The next generation might be more motivated, well, I'll get a better deal there because the interest rate, rate's low there or I've got a better overdraft there, that side of things. Mm-hmm. But more and more, it's, it's stuff like that. So as a tester, bring it to testing, how do you test for those kind of three mindsets mm-hmm. uh, as well? So one way you do it is through having diverse teams. You know, having mm. diversity is including as, as an age and a generation thing. So well, if you have people within those, those communities as well, that, that helps give that shift and helps marketing, I guess, to say, well, do you know what? We, we don't mind that we're alienating people that, that might not like that because we are looking for the young, the... Yeah, that's our strategy. Yeah. One, one of the challenges with software development is is you, you make one change over here and it breaks something over here for some unknown reason. And so how do you deal with that in a world where you've got Amazon, who I don't know how often they update their website, but probably by the time we've been sat here, they've updated it 500 yeah. times or something. So how do you keep on top of that in an ever-evolving world? Yeah, so change is constant, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the one thing that, that if you don't like change or we fear changes, you really struggle with, both in IT and indeed in testing as well. We, tools are used for, for that continuous delivery, uh, that, that side of things. It was one of the points that I think you made earlier as well. How do you test for that? It's, it's back to that risk model as well. We use tools, so automation is a thing that we, we all hear, uh, mm. certainly in the last 10 years, but it's been there a lot earlier than that in testing. So because I got involved in automation quite early on in my career, uh, you also see in these things, it's quite cyclic. In fact, some things that are coming up, you think, oh, well, that, 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 this, this feels a bit deja vu and it comes <laughs> around again. So yeah, you have automation in place. So in the situation you see where there's constant change, what will happen is that's changed when that, becomes part of the the build or the release that will trigger off some tests to say right okay has has the thing that's changed uh, worked so there'll be a, a, a test to cover that that thing that's that's worked uh, changed and then there'll be what they call regression testing to make sure well actually how do we know everything else is okay yeah how do we know we're not broken anything else or so, have, so that'll be a series of automated tests which run all over the website and make sure that everything else is still functioning as it should for those fast delivery ones i'd be yeah it needs automation in place to do that pace yeah Mm. otherwise you're not going to cover it Mm. it's very similar to our world in terms of we were talking about rpa before we came on and it's i guess it's using that same technology but using it in the context of testing yeah so automation is fantastic i really enjoyed the time of automation 
where we're going with automation is really quite exciting. The fact that you can automate mobile devices. I remember watching some presentations where actually to automate a mobile device, you had a robot with a finger that came down and pressed it like the wood. That's that's light years away <laughs> uh, now from what we can do in that side of things. <laughs> but we, we always need the, the people element alongside mm. automation because automation, we call it automation tests, but it's not, it's, it's actual checks. Mm. Yeah. Until AI really gets involved in this, what automation will do will run the same test the same way every single time. We talked about people being fallible, but pe people making mistakes. Automation mm. takes that off the table. But someone still needs to say, these are the things we want you to check. Mm. Someone still needs to be able to say, these are the ones we want you to check every time you do a release, whether that's min every minute, every hour, every second, mm. that side of things, or these are the ones we want to run at the end of the day. So that intelligence still needs to happen. Now AI, where it's going, where it's coming, and how it can profile where your users are using your system, is bringing some really exciting stuff to that. And who knows, yeah, maybe we're going to be in the minority report days for yeah, yeah. doing all that. Tell, tell us about that then. Where, where do you think it's going to go in terms of evolving the world of, world of testing? So it is, it, there's a huge market. There's change all over the place. There's still need for it as well. I think, unfortunately, any growth market, you, you see that... Uh, you get a lot of people in there and sometimes not everyone is good testers. As I say, anyone can be a tester, but not everyone's a good tester. Mm. Where I see it going is, is more that good testers will be more valued and the lesser ones will, will maybe drop off just purely because people know what a good tester looks like. What does a good tester look like? Good, good. Like that. Oh, that's you got. <laughs> that's been a bit of a, a theme throughout our chat so far. <clears throat> you, you've really emphasised good testers and, and I'm up until we met i've not really considered testing or what a tester does or anything like that so i'm just quite intrigued as to what is a good tester is it someone that fills in all the documentation accurately and detailed or is it what is it so in the testing community we'll talk about the kind of core skills a tester needs to have like attention to detail quality focus being quite pragmatic and these sorts so of no things. for me then. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll see, you, you you probably know people that, oh, you make a good test or whatever. Usually it's uh, our, our partners, other half, you know, like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're quite uh, attention to detail folks, that sort of thing. We talk about those. They're, they're the kind of the golden pillars of testing from years ago. You know, if somebody was really good at attention to your spot spelling mistakes, they're the kind of things that you would see, yeah. But more and more to cope with how IT is changing, technology is changing, Good testers are, are, are building further skills. So there's the opportunity to bring more technical skills into that as well. So more and more, everyone's saying that you need to understand uh, how things are built. Right. Yeah. And that's how I got into to testing. I was the guy that used to take televisions apart and put speakers on the wall to see how they're broken. You get electric shocks and you go, right, oh, don't do that. That, that, that side <laughs> of things. But good testers have got that that kind of interest and in, 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 they're not necessarily geeks or, 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 or techs in that way of understanding full uh, development principles, but they're interested to ask those sorts of questions, you know, even to the point, why are you asking me that question? Why do you need to know that? And it's out of just professional curiosity, yeah. Uh, so, so that aspect is really quite growing as well. Uh, you'll also see good testers are ones that will go beyond just the kind of running of tests. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll try and understand the business and try and work with the business to understand how, how it is the business works. Because testers need to kind of test from the aspect of the business user yeah, and understand who those business users are. And testers hopefully trying to eat where we add value uh, is, is to kind of take some of that pain away from when we get to the user acceptance level where we say, right, the business are the only people that know how to use this. They're the ones that, they're the only ones that can do this. And as, as you know, from the business point of view, uh, the people have got day jobs and, and they've got targets and, and the profitability of companies is, is hinging on the, the guys doing, coming in day in, day out and doing their job. Asking them to do something else makes it quite hard for them, especially if they've not got that mindset of kind of, right, how do I break this back to the analogy of oh, can you break these things or what kind of different tests do I need to run? What data do I need? All these sorts of things. So a good tester will look at that and look at that quite holistically across that side of things as well. That's really interesting because I think one of the things we, I'm going to say struggle, but I think sometimes you know, being open, it, it can be frustrating for us is we win a project understand the requirements, uh, create, you know, the acceptance criteria. And then really it's 
we want the client to go through that testing. Mm -hmm. But as you just said a couple of minutes ago, half the issue is they've still got their normal job to do. And this is just seen to be a, oh, do I have to do it? Why can't it just crack on? Why can't we just crack on? And, and actually just listening to you, I'm kind of thinking, uh, maybe we, we should A, be advising potential clients to engage with a tester, or we provide them with an independent tester to do it at their end. Because the, the benefits to us are our user acceptance or you know that particular at a time of that we allow in projects up, yeah. could be sped up so mm -hmm. it frees up our team to go on and do other projects and thereby you know more efficiency but we also know then that the client has it's been thoroughly tested and right here's your dozen you know um uh, observations quite like that one <laughs> a dozen observations right we'll get back we'll get, get cracking and, and half the thing that i think we experience currently is that often we're helping in a finance environment always under pressure mm -hmm. month end year end quarter end whatever it is that returns the whole shooting match and and actually they never have time yeah, which yeah. is why they're a great target for us <laughs> yeah that's the whole reason why they're invested in the technology to yeah. save them time so you're right that whole user acceptance piece or the the speed trying to shot and that speed to value and get them yeah. get them up to speed is, is how much can i guess your soft official professional testers do versus at what point do you need the actual users to get involved and actually you start using the solution from a user acceptance yeah, system is there any best practice like bullet points you can give <laughs> that'll be quite good <laughs> yeah. no can you just sort that so, testing yeah, yeah. So, yeah so i think this is where agile starts to get this right as well because i think where organizations tend to get it wrong is user acceptance we talk about testing being at the end but user acceptance is right at the end you know it's like the week before you go live that side of things mm. so this is where agile starts getting it right you're always going to have to have that interaction with the users and with the business in any project that, that you're looking to put in of course you are trying to shift that left and getting that involvement early on to ask those questions so but tell me how you let me profile how you use the system you know, we talked about usability. You can even put cameras on, on screens and all watch where the main bits of the application that people use and this side of things. So you can do that early and get that and capture that as requirements. If you capture it as requirements, it's prioritized, it's measured, it's sized. <coughs> people can then test on that on that, that kind of model of, of being, being that person. We, we talk about being user acceptance and, and a lot of people call it user acceptance testing as well. So again, that user acceptance phase still needs to happen at the end but it is more of an acceptance phase what you're asking the users then to say can you use this system to do your job which is a different statement to can you find problems with it yeah mm -hmm. that side of things so get people involved in earlier on and, and change that, that that dialogue around so that's not getting somebody with a test that's getting somebody with the project with the project team with the business analysis uh, and understanding that you can win confidence as well There's, People are people, you know, and, and, and egos comes into everything that we do in IT, but people like to know that they're important and valued. So you can you can find people in the business who are your key users, your super users, and you can kind of take them aside and say, look, we want to get you involved in this really exciting project and you're going to be one of the first people and you're going to be like a super user and, and all this. And that, that makes people feel important on yeah. that side of things. And then it's almost like train the trainer, then you, you're training mm -hmm. that then and engaging them. As, and then by targeting the right people, you won't get as much of that sometimes that feedback that you get in UAT or user acceptance uh, where people are too busy and at that point the kind of backs are up and, and, and they're looking for problems they're looking for reasons to say no rather than reasons to say yes yeah. so finding these we've experienced it definitely where we've we've not identified a strong super user that's mm. it might be a, a gap within their sort of employee base and then when they've brought someone in with the different skill sets all of a sudden it's a different project and yeah. it's been delivered differently and all of a sudden it's up and running and that's everything but you're right they go looking for problems yeah and by bringing these people in early because we talk about like uh, like bottlenecks and mm. projects don't we and it's the most the worst type of bottlenecks you get is when you get to oh only that person knows how to use that system and if you're finding that out in UAT then you you just it's just going to go on for as long as that person is feels like they want to do it yeah. is, is not on holiday is not doing all the other things you identify that early and say right can we transfer that knowledge but we've also got to look at it from the business's perspective as well i think often we see this purely just looking out 
out towards a business, not inwards as well. Because yeah, we're talking about change and how people fear change. We've got to recognise that uh, IT is, is is unfortunately historically been one of the biggest things that make people redundant. You know, when mm. they see change coming through, they go right, oh, this is my job, and now you're asking me to prove that you can, the system can do what you I can, can replace do. me. Yeah, so mm. we've got to be aware of that and and help appease. Uh, th those concerns or, or flag those concerns to, to people that can deal with those because often sometimes that might be the case you know mm. uh, and, and then we're the ones giving that message rather than it coming from that organisation themselves to say yeah look change is afoot it's not just the system mm. fortunately we're going to have to to move things on and, and those are difficult conversations it comes more of a change management job than it does a testing job yeah it? yeah and it's a communications thing as well yeah. uh, often projects that go wrong in that area the communication's just not there mm. you know they just hear about it the last there's not that kind of build up to it say look here's this we always put all the energy in the marketing into calling these things like project phoenix or project yeah. <laughs> new universe and all these side of things as well but it talks we need to do that and, and take people on that journey mm. as well and say well this bit you're doing here fits into the bigger thing. Training's another thing as well. We, we often say, right, here you go, have a look at that. You might have had a conversation six months ago about what it is you want to do, but <laughs> there you go. So it's about training inside. And a lot of the bugs that you find usually in UAT are because the people haven't been trained properly in the system either. So back to that idea of getting super users and getting that training and, and, and having that organic training going in there as well. And you'll find... So how, how scripted should... UAT be do you think or should it be here you go here's some training on the solution but go and do your job or should it be kind of click by click I want you to test this user story and this acceptance criteria and how prescriptive is it to the individual or should it be it should be prescriptive at a scenario level to say okay. these are the scenarios that you're doing yeah it should be saying right these are the kind of end to end journeys that you need to go through the system because okay. it will be very very rare if, if your project is a standalone project and and that is one system you know there's no integration yeah. to payroll hr billing third parties and that side of things so we need to do those journeys but there's absolute value in just having that high level to say right do this journey and giving it to two people because they'll do it in two different ways you know they'll, some they might use keyboard shortcuts some they might use the mouse some mm. they might not use the mouse that's it some they might use the phone to do that side, side of things as well okay. that's completely valid to do that your good testers will understand that as well and, and, and test for those early. Yeah. The fact that you're repeating that test, and we don't really want to repeat tests, but in this case you do because what we want to see in user acceptance is, as I say, this might be the first time that we're seeing it. By knowing that the test they're going to run work, that builds confidence mm. and that takes away that kind of naysay on that side of things. You're, you're delivering confidence in them saying, and then when you ask them the question, can you use this system to do your day job? you're more likely to hear the yes mm. yeah okay one of the you touched on agile earlier and one of the um things that gets talked about around agile is this idea of t-shaped individuals mm -hmm. developer i don't test and as a tester saying well you're a developer you're not very good at testing so is, is that still the case or is are the two roles starting to kind of merge together in a way there's still independence, but equally, there are places that, that, that do have that, that principle and follow it here. But that's based on not, not the fact they're doing Agile, not because there's a thing called T-shape, but it's based mm -hmm. on the people that have got it and the experience of those people that have got it. I would say it's still quite rare in, in the market. Being involved in recruitment, it, it, it's, it, it is rare to get those, those sorts of people. I'm of the mind that uh, if you get people doing what it is, what it is they enjoy and what they do and what they love, then then they'll do a better job. Mm. Yeah, great. You will get these T-shaped people. You will get people that are happy sitting across all that and they want to do more of that. And and you will know these people because these are probably ones that are better rewarded, well rewarded within organisations. But equally, a team is not all made up with all T's. Yeah, yeah. You got fence if you got a lot of T's, <laughs> but you made up with diversity. You've got people that actually. Do you know what? I'm I'm about depth rather than breadth here. I'm I'm more of an I, you yeah. know. Or you get people that are pies. Apparently, you get a pie shaped tester now as well. That's that's two T's together where you uh, can okay. you yeah. can go down that stack as well. And <laughs> uh, in, in last organisation, we actually started playing around with the idea of having a T shaped tester because we talk about you have a performance tester yeah. or an automation tester. But how about if you had a tester that could do those range of things? Which on the surface sounds yeah, well that's that's a no given, but they are extreme specialisms 
mm. especially in security, especially in, in performance. If you build those skills up within testing, that means as a tester, when I'm coming to something, I'm not just looking how it functionally performs. I'm I'm counting on watch how long it takes to load. I'm not doing a full performance testing for the Grand National, but on my machine, if this is taking 40 seconds to load, if I get 100 users behind it, it's going to be even worse, isn't it? So I can start flagging up these things. And how easy is it to move from a, a functional tester to an automation tester? You can actually add an R third to that and say the development side as well. Mm. How does a developer transition into automation? And, and, and equally, they can both happen. They do need uh, additional skills, need that technical understanding. Yeah. Being biased, being a tester and being a background, um, by background being tested, I see the best automation testers are the ones that have got that background in testing. Okay. Yeah. What that means is they, they, because you can automate anything these days, you know, mm. it, or any, people that sell the tools can tell you that anyway, you can automate everything. But te people that have come from testing background will know the ones that they should automate and the ones that they shouldn't automate. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas developers will see more of a challenge, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm, you know, you, you, no, you can't do that. Well, yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, I can. And you've got this thing. You go, look, I told you, can. You go, yeah, you're right. You did it. But what's the value in that? What's the what's what's the point in doing that? Hmm. People from that testing background have got that 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 kind of value driven thing. And it's it's interesting because back to your question about good testers, you might think a good tester is somebody who's got a really good perspective of right and wrong. Yeah, this is right and that's wrong, black and white. Been testing now, especially with the number of things that you can and can't test. It's more about the value, no value. You know, does it matter that that's not right? Mm. Does it matter that that's not quite right? You know, it does matter that this is right, and focusing on that because I've seen so many testers with such a strong black and white yeah. that they're a lone voice in a meeting. You know, you've probably seen them, and you go, "I should shut up about rabbing on about that thing," and, and and they've not picked up. But from them, they are they are they are like the in Lord of the Rings, that thou shalt not pass. I am the quality keeper of the guardian. That that you need to change that, and they're just destroying their their voice. That that voice needs to be raised. But when you do raise it, it's like always Colin Wolf. You know, you, yeah. you've, you've lost that credibility. Mm. One of the things that I always ask every every podcast is, cast your mind forward ten years. What do you think the world of software testing is going to look like? Are there any key things that you think will change over in ten years' time? Oh, that's a good question. I should have told you that question before you came. But if yeah. you watch the podcast, you see. Yeah. <laughs> Are we done on? You mentioned AI, so I think that might be. Yeah, I think say. anything in my experience over the last 25 years is the things that we plan for or, or, or think that we think we should for are the things that, that, that just come out of the blue. COVID yeah. came out yeah. of the blue. The internet kind of came out of the blue as well in the way that that, that came about. Uh, I'm not technically enough to know is there another year or two thousand if you listen to the, the panic merchants they might be saying oh yeah 2026 is another year two, 2000 that's going to come out that side of things I think the main crux is the flexibility side of things we're going to see more and more on that because we have to pivot we have to change direction just, just because the world is such an uncertain place mm. 10 years ago 5 years ago 3 years ago we thought it was a certain place you know we, we wouldn't be thrown off balance we wouldn't be uh, we knew it was. I think that the way we work is going to change as well, uh, as we've seen in the last couple of years. And now we're starting to see a, a kind of move or, or a gentle push back to, to what it was before as well. I think those sorts of things. But I think testers are well placed to do that because testers are adaptable. You know, mm. uh, you can be a, an out and out SAP tester and you go into one project test SAP, you go into another one, it'll be different. It's the same underlying software, but. It talks to different things. It's you. You've got to be adaptable. Those testers that aren't adaptable mm. are the ones that are going going to struggle. But I think they're more in the minority now, because before the majority, and, and before they would have been the ones you've seen. Oh, they're good testers. They're they're that single point of failure, but they're the one that knows everything about that system. Is is COVID and flexible working and people working from home? Has that changed the I guess the resource pool for testing? Are people using more? offshore testers now than they were three, four years ago before the world changed? Or I don't know if it's changed so much, but I think there's more of a kind of natural acceptance of before if there was points to say, oh, oh actually, we're, hmm. it's now going past five, six o'clock in that territory. That, that, that That's more of an issue. It's more of a kind of, well, that's just that person's working arrangements hmm. in the same way that that person needs to walk the dog or that person needs to pick up children, that side of things. I think there's more of a, 
an acceptance. And I think COVID worked because it was an international sh- change. You know, it's not it's not a region, it's not a country. Hmm. Uh, the whole world had to move. So as a result, everyone else has kind of come along to it. People will have been telling you, oh, I told you that was 10 years ago, but it required something so epic to move us all into that way of thinking. Otherwise, it would just be all... Oh, that territory that they just do that so we'll just go there because it's cheaper or they just do it a little bit better on that way and that side of things yeah good stuff all right any more questions no brilliant James. i have to be honest i was thinking not you personally but i was thinking testing that's going to be a bit of a subject you know <laughs> honestly i've learned so much it's been it's been brilliant i've I'm loved it downstairs and see tests downstairs yeah 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 i'll be intrigued. i'll, I'll I'll stand behind you as you walk in and ask. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole new world, isn't it? And it's it's difficult as well as we, as we find it. It's, testing is probably a, one of the challenging areas of our projects, getting clients to have the time you know, and the experience to actually get hands-on and test it. And I think the third part to that is see the value of it. Yeah. For me, the, obvi- yeah. the value is obvious, <laughs> but for them, if it adds X, Y, or Z onto their, onto their project cost, they're like, oh, well, well. I don't want want to pay that and it's like I try and get that message across because we've had a couple of customers and I can I won't name any but I remember a couple where oh yeah I've done my testing yeah yeah I think it's fine I've Mm. put a few invoices through let's go live they go live flood it through full of invoices and whatnot hang on what's all this and then it then all the bugs come out then all the problems then they're inundating our support desk we'll fix forward it's all right we'll fix forward (laughs) let's just how do I unpick this ledger that's uh, yeah my accountant's gonna go mad but yeah, the value thing is it, it, it's a challenge and it's, throughout my career, it's always like, well, why do we need testers? You know, it's a, a common conversation, but less and less, we're, we're kind of hearing that now. It's more about how can we get more testers or how we can get testers involved earlier on or what is it? what value are you going to give if we introduce you now and that side of things. My generation, my early career, fear was was, was one of the motivators. Was We were going through euro triangulation for a finance company, moving to the euro. So if you didn't do that, then big problems mm. year 2000 which was a great thing for testers it was good. i think that's where we saw we talk about these these weak or poor testers so a lot of people come in there because that's where the money was yeah yeah so they were used as, as kind of oh you've got to do it organizations that are heavily regulated testing that is is, is is something that it's not optional it's you just need to yeah. do and that's mm. the thing. I've, got, I've got one final question if that's all right mm, of course who who engages with you? Is it the developers or is it clients? I'm guessing it might be a mixture of both, but typically who would be your client, the the, the user or the developer? Oh, so stakeholders used to be a kind of thing that only project managers used to work about, but we really talk about that more at a testing level because testers are our stakeholders. Uh, testers do unit testing. That's their responsibility. Uh, so we need to understand what, what it is, not necessarily what they've tested, but what they haven't tested. Yeah, I'm not I'm not precious about what they have tested. We can help them if they're saying, I don't know how to test. So we can teach them about boundary value analysis and all these wonderful terms that makes them do better. But I'm more focused on what haven't you tested. For me, as a test manager as well, it's not about what have you done, but what have you not done? You know, and and that's a, that's an open and honest conversation because if you've not done it, we need to make sure that's covered somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. So that conversation with developers there, with with with, with the the BAs as well, talking about the requirements and saying, right, let's let's look at the requirements. How, how do they look like? Uh, can we test them? Are they testable? That's the first thing we look at because if we don't have a testable requirement, ambiguity comes in and we make assumptions and all these sorts of things. PMs are still one of our main uh, stakeholders because because we provide information. That conduit is through the project manager. On the business arm, of course, yep, working with the business, working with uh, sponsors as well to help them in their decisions and, and, and how they support that with, with the end users as well uh, and on finding out how they use that system. But then also to use it as almost like show and tells so us saying, well, this is what we are testing to give them a, a kind of forum and say to them, look, we know you use acceptance coming up, but if there's things that you want us to test on your behalf, tell us now and we'll do it. It's it's free, you know. You, you tell us that we'll test it now, and then we'll tell you how it's going. You know, tell us about it, and we can yeah. do it. When you're developing testers, are you like from a recruitment perspective? Do you recruit grads a lot of the time and mm-hmm. kind of develop them through? Yep. And 
what backgrounds are you looking for? Are you taking computer science grads that have got that technical background and developing a testing capability as well? Yeah, so the STEM side of things. So most organisations that have got a graduate uh, intake are looking for people with technical abilities. Mm. Uh, even most recruitment for, for testers now are looking for people with experience in automation. You'll see fewer positions for what, what would be called manual testing. Mm. So I don't like the term manual testing because that it's almost like demeaning testing. So you don't have a manual developer, a manual BA, do you? You have a BA, mm. you have a BA, yeah. you don't have a manual PM, you just have manual testers. Yeah. But manual says it's, when I think about manual, it feels like you're somebody that's picking up the rubbish in the middle of the <laughs> reservation in the Joe Cadre because you've done something naughty. You know, it's manual labour. Yeah. Testers use tools. They might not use automation, but they'll use uh, API tools so they can test an API. They'll use mind mapping tools to model a complex business mm. scenario. So test... Testers themselves are quite surprised when you say, oh, what's that? Oh, using Excel and I'm doing this. And you go, how did you do that? Or using this plugin in Jira and using these things in Chrome and all the testers use tools. Mm. But you will see, you still see people using it, but you'll see less of those roles. So STEM is the main thing at an entry level. I've had really great success employing people that have come with maybe a history background or... Uh, criminology as well is, is, is an all interesting one because they are people that, that can look at facts and mm. research and understand things and, and and look at why things have happened and think, well, what else could have happened as a result of that? Mm. Uh, and and again, it, it, you got to look at your team and say, you, you don't want all T's, you want, you want a blend, yeah? Some teams you want more T's than others, of course you will, mm. but having people there that have got that diversity in your testing will... will is really invaluable. So in recruitment, I always encourage, talk about that, never recruit somebody in your own image. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would also encourage people to, well, look at the person that you're recruiting in front of you and, and, and try and fit them in your team. If you can't fit them in your team, then that's at the point it's, it's not successful. In what sense fit them in, in terms of characteristics? Or... Yeah, yeah, it's the skills they have, their, yeah. their, their behaviours, their experience. Mm. Uh, how they test, where they test, what complements the team that you've got, what, what what do they bring that you've not got? Yeah, yeah. Accessibility is a really good good yeah. thing. So people that are getting involved in accessibility, accessibility testing, I think is the best thing that's happened to testing. It really is. It's looking at systems now on a, on a kind of even keel rather than those kind of oh people that can access and people that can't access rather than going well how do we make it so everyone can access? Can yeah, bring that to life for us because yeah I've got some knowledge but not loads on accessibility testing. So what does that involve? So accessibility is that, that premise of how do you make a system so anyone can use it regardless of, of their, their their ability, yeah? yeah? Because in the past you'd talk about disability. So disability is, is quite a negative thing. It's something you can't do rather than accessible to lose. So how do you make this so something that everyone can do? Yeah, yeah. Be because there's like... Uh, there's, there's different types of, of, of things that accessibility. There's like situational accessibility. So... If you were to have an accident uh, and you might lose your arm, for example, then that's a permanent uh, disability you've mm -hmm. had. Uh, you might be on a train where you've got to hold on to the thing. That's a situational one where it's well, you've only got one hand. How do you check your balance? Can you reach the, the top key there on there as well mm -hmm. uh, as you can? Gotcha. Yeah. So th there's that side of things. There's regulation uh, in place as well. So most government agencies and, and, and certainly in the health sector, they had... Uh, regulations that they had to have their external facing sites uh, to a certain level of, of quality uh, with regards to what they call AAA. So it's like the AA, but there's A, AA and AAA and getting to the different level of standards on that right. as well. That, just as I had come out of that space, uh, was then moving to, well, it's not good enough that you're doing that for external people. You need to do that also for your internal people as well because, yeah, it's great that you've got a busy website for your customers to use, but probably employees, what mm. are the people doing that job, that side of things as well. But it's a really it's a really great thing. Testers are well placed in that because we're used to thinking about systems and different personas, yeah, different mm. roles. So how do we think about that? And, and the tools in that area are really good. There's organisations that can help you. There's a really successful organisation down in Bristol who was employed with people with impairments. Uh, the, 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 there, was a, there was a blind guy that did a demonstration for us as well. And the way that we always hear about these speech recognition things on, on, on your tools. If you ever mm -hmm. switch it on, you're like, oh, how do I switch it off? More than how useful is this? But it was just really insightful to see, well, how would somebody with limited or no vision use an application with this thing? And, and the speed that, that it was reading out to you, like going, I can't, I can't keep up, I can't keep up, 
you know, it's, it's really fascinating, really, as I say, you, you think you've got a problem, and then you look at it through a different lens that somebody else is looking at, right, that's a whole spectrum of, excuse the pun, mm. uh, spectrum of changes there that, that, that you, yeah, just not exposed to, so it's really exciting that side of things as well. Loads of stuff you just don't even think about. No, yeah. not at all. But, totally. yeah, really good. Thank you very much for joining Brilliant. us, Neil. Thanks for having me. Thank Great you. session. Brilliant. Right, before you go, I'm under strict instructions by our content wizard to ask you to like, subscribe, share, comment, do whatever you can to feed the algorithm. As usual, I'll see you next Monday at 7am for another really insightful conversation. Thank you very much.